Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you have given us. You are gracious in your provision. For really, apart from Christ, we deserve nothing from you. Today, as we discuss Commandments 9 and 10, and really kind of look back at the law that you have given us, help us be content with the provision that you have given us so that we do not covet the things that you've given others, and so that we also can be good stewards of the things that you have given us for the benefit of others. Guide our discussion and our deliberation, that it may glorify you and uplift the people in this class. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, if you want to open up your catechisms to page 115. 115 is where we're going to be starting. And I'm being ambitious today. So uh, we're going to try and cover 9 and 10. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, but they are they are pretty closely related. Um, so most of the questions that you'd be asking about one probably apply to the other as well. Um, so let's do our normal exercise of reading those together. So we're going to start with the ninth commandment. Let's read the ninth commandment together. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. Now, what does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house or get it in a way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. All right, that's commandment nine. Now we'll do commandment 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals, or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do it. Okay. So those are the commandments we're going to be covering. And if you would use one word to describe these two commandments, that word would be the word covet. So we're going to look at what that means. But before we get to the definition of the word covet, I wanted to do a little exercise because if you're like me, it's really easy to come up with the things that you don't have that you wish you did. But sometimes it's more difficult to think of the things that I ought to be grateful of that God has already given me, right? So the beginning exercise for class today is I want you to name 10 things which God has given you that you are grateful for and be specific, okay? Um, so just write these on your sheet and then I may ask uh, if anybody wishes to share, okay? So take a couple of minutes and write down 10 things that God has given you that you are grateful for. Could be possessions, can be family, could be a freedom, a job, can be a person in your life. Could even be a challenge that God brought to you that he used in a manner that benefited you. All right, as you guys are writing some of those, does anybody want to share one or two? Something God has given you that you're grateful for? Peace. Huh? Peace. Peace. Uh, hey, somebody was listening to the sermon. <laughs> grateful for the peace that God has given them. Yeah? Karen? Um, multimedia. Today. Multimedia. Yeah, right? Now, that should be on everybody who's watching this on Zoom. That should be on your list. <laughs> you're just so thankful for God that you're able to listen to me talk, even if you can't be here in person. Such a blessing. Anybody else? Good health. Good health, right? Good health. Family. Family. Friends. Friends. Unfettered access to the word. 
unfettered access to the word. That's good. Room and board. Room and board. Very good. Yeah. Church and faith. Church and faith. Right. That's very good. According to our teachings, faith is a gift. What else? God's grace. God's grace. Good one. Now, you may have noticed a lot of the things that we're mentioning. Are they extraordinary things or are they things that are just part of our everyday lives? They're part of our everyday lives. And so, what's one other commonality we usually have regarding those things? We take them for granted. Right? That's one of the reasons that sometimes it's so easy to focus on the things that we don't have because we're just so used to the things that we have. Right? And it's the same with our Christian faith, too. Like, I love how there are moments where I say something from the scriptures, like it's just, you know, a regular sentence in human language, and it's uttering like one of the most profound and radical claims of truth the world has ever seen. And I just say it like it's nothing, right? And when I start to really think about it, I'm like, man, I should really be thinking about that more when I say it, right? Like Jesus died on the cross. How many times you heard that sentence, right? But what you're claiming when you say you believe that is that God became a man. He didn't just take on the form, but became a man and died. That's got to be one of the most radical claims in human history. Right? So we have lots of things in our lives to be grateful for to God. And I wanted to couch our discussion of the ninth and tenth commandment in that context. Right? That we're not just talking about the the difficulty of not desiring things that other people have been given that we have not been given. But the context of that is we have been given far more than we often realize. Okay. All right. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to say a prayer of thanksgiving. And as I say that prayer of thanksgiving, I want you to think specifically about some of the things you wrote down. And I want you in the silence of your heart to offer up the thanksgiving to God. I'll have a little pause in there, and we're going to offer up our thanksgiving for these gifts. Okay? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are so gracious and merciful with us. We so regularly forget about the gracious things that you've given us, and we take them for granted, and often end up focusing so much on one or two things that we really want that you haven't given us, that we're blind to the many, often, more miraculous things that you have already given us. So this time, Lord, we take a moment to offer up our prayer of thanksgiving for all that you have given us. And Lord, we know that even this list is insufficient. We are aware that even the things, there are many things that even we are not aware of that you have given us. And so we trust in your gracious provision, most exemplified in our Lord Jesus Christ, who has provided for our salvation, who died on the cross for our sins and rose victorious over the dead to bring us a peace that passes understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I wanted to start with that exercise because, like I said, if you're like me, it's the same with prayer. It's harder to think of prayers of thanksgiving than prayers of request. Uh, but it's important that we do that. Okay. So uh, let's split to page 116 in your catechism. And on that page, it should be a passage from James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Can someone read that for us? A half, a little bit less than halfway on the page. Pete, go ahead. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not real that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. All right, so. What is coveting? What is coveting? We're going to come up with a definition for coveting we're going to use today. Desiring. Desiring. Okay, coveting is desiring. Is all desiring coveting? 
No. no. So we got our first part. It's a desire. But what specifically about it makes it coveting? What someone else has. You're desiring what somebody else has. Okay. Is now, is that necessarily wrong? No. no. Is it a jealous desire? Okay. So we're getting a little more specific here. So it's a desire, a desire that some of something someone else has. And I say a jealous desire. Okay. What does jealous desire mean? You're entitled to something that you do not have. Okay, right? So it's a, it's something you feel entitled to, even though it isn't yours. Yeah, I did. It's a sinful desire. A I sinful mean, desire. Somebody has a piece of God. We want that. They want that. We want to tell others about it. All right. So it's a sinful desire of something that belongs to somebody else. Yeah, Jim. It's something that you can't obtain no matter how much you want it's not something that's like oh that person has a nice car i'm gonna get the same car it's you want the man's house you want his wife or something that very good right have. so it's a simple desire for something that belongs to somebody else that you can't get your own version of right the desire isn't for uh, a car like your neighbor's car it's for your neighbor's car right <laughs> a desire for your neighbor's house not a house like your neighbor's right um, the best example I can think of of this is actually from my nephew, Ned, who is a selfish little human being like every toddler. And we were on vacation and he wanted a lime because he saw his mom eating a lime. And his mom said, oh, well, I'll cut one for you. And he said, no, I want that one. I want the one you're eating. Okay? So that is the difference between just desiring something that talks to someone else and the sinful desire of coveting. Okay? It's not that you want something like it. It's not that you're asking God to bring you something like it. It's you want the very thing that belongs to them. Right? And that's sinful because of what? Yeah, God gives us our daily bread and we should be thankful for what we have and give them and not respond with a lack of faith to what we have. Very good, right? So God gives us our daily bread. He also gives who their daily bread? Neighbor. Your neighbor, right? So if they have something, unless they got it through sinful means, it was a gift of God to them, right? And so when we want something that belongs to somebody else, there's something happening on the faith spectrum of things, is that I am not trusting that God's wisdom and the way he builds out provision is good. I'm thinking, you know, I'll cut you some slack, big guy. I know you got a lot of people to keep track of, but that should have been mine. <laughs> it's essentially what you're saying when you come at something. Right? And when you act in that manner, what are you acting as? Selfish. You're, well, you are selfish, but you're not really trying to behave as a human anymore. What are you trying to behave as? <laughs> God. Right? You're trying to dictate to God how things should be distributed, right? Because essentially, you're saying, I think I know a bit better about where this should go. Yeah, Russ. So, and again, I don't want to guess. I don't want to try to get people. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, so that last verse, though, that's in the James passage. Yeah. Like, isn't yeah. there a ton of really bad theology that's been launched from that? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that is very true. So we should point that out. So the James passage we read, the last verse, Russ is saying, hasn't there been a lot of bad theology launched from that? And that is true. So one of the biggest ones and the most common one is prosperity gospel, where they'll teach you and they'll make the claim, even though the scriptures deny it in multiple places, that if you just ask for things from God, if your faith is genuine, you will get them. Okay. The problem for that, from that approach from our perspective is you're essentially turning prayer into something where God is meeting you on your terms, which isn't the way that works. Right, the way it works is that God is meeting you on His terms. Right, He's graciously allowed you to speak with Him in that manner. Right, so I've always found it helpful when I think of prayer. Of like, I've got an audience with the King. I'm coming into His throne room, and when you come into the King's throne room, you don't you don't come in of your own demand. You're invited in. Right? So your everything that goes on in there is on the King's terms and not on yours. And so you're standing there trembling because you're in the presence of the king and he's inviting you to speak frankly with him, which is a great privilege, as prayer is. Right? 
So what James is saying is not saying there that if you ask, it will be given. I think what that's more highlighting is the fact how many times have you wanted something and you've done just about everything except pray to God to receive it, right? Uh, I do that all the time, right? I, an issue arises or, or a conflict shows up or a need is, is, has to be met, whether in my life or life of somebody I know. And my first reaction, and this is probably the just beat into me as an American, is to pull myself up on my own bootstraps and figure out a solution, right? Yeah. And as a Christian, what should my first reaction be? Pray about it. Pray about it. Commit whatever I'm going to attempt to try to do to his blessing. Because if I do it without him, what is my work? It's vain, right? It's not going to actually do it, right? All right. Pastor, I think, yeah. I think in, in, in another nature, um, it's not so much being unsatisfied that I don't have that. It's not being satisfied in all that I do have. And, and 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 not being in being content with all of the things that God lavishly has, has graced to us. Yeah, so that's the sort of two sides to the same coin, right? Because what leads you to covet your neighbor's car? A dissatisfaction with your own or your own lack of, right? And what causes that dissatisfaction is not trusting that God is going to take care of you. Right? That he's not going to provide what you need when you need it, right? And then, like I had this sort of reaction when I started thinking about you know the first couple of years after you graduate from grad school, especially if you're going to be a pastor, it's not like I'm making two hundred thousand dollars right out of the gate like I would be if I was a lawyer or a doctor. So money's pretty tight, right? And so oh man, there's a tree, there's an ash tree in your front yard. It's going to cost twenty five hundred dollars to chop it down and clear out the stump. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that's like all of the savings that I have saved up because I just had to fix something else about five or six months ago. And then I'm worried and anxious about it. And every single time God has like, that's happened to me like six or seven different times for other things. And every single time God has provided. And so it's weird. Like if your friend tells you the truth six times, you typically believe them after that. So why is it that with God, I'm still struggling to believe that he's going to provide when he always does. Right. And maybe not exactly in the way I'm anticipating, to be sure. But yeah, uh, Rob, did you end up? Yeah. How does this differ from the the man that says, "I shall not steal"? Is that about the same? Thing? They're rooted. Well, so you'll notice there's a lot of overlap with the individual commandments because essentially what you're doing when you're breaking them is you're functioning or you're trying to function as God in particular areas. So stealing is more about the action that results from the desire we're talking about right now. So, and the reason that this is so important is it isn't just the actual taking of your neighbor's car that's a sin, the, the desire of it is, right? Um, so the distinction there is, is typically the, the thought of the heart and the action. So we, we already talked a little bit about, about that with the seventh command. We talked a little bit about the internal stuff and that's really what nine and 10 is about. And also, not all stealing has to be covetous. I could be stealing from someone else. <laughs> True. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good point as well. Like, you're not always coveting things when you steal them, right? You could just be a greedy person. So, it's not necessarily that you want that particular thing, but I'm just going to take their money because I can. Uh, Rob. Yeah, the mere fact that we're born or that we live in this country, in this age, is, is a huge gift that we can easily overlook. Kings oh, yeah. didn't live this well 150 years ago. I actually, I, I randomly had a thought about that. So Rob said that the, that like being born at this time and living in this place is a huge gift that we often overlook. And, and that's very true in many ways. And I was, I was thinking, I had a weird thought about that when I was feeding my dog and food and water after a walk, is that I was thinking, my dog might be better fed than like some humans, <laughs> right? Uh, and that's just a normal part of my life that I never really think about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, right. Okay, so we're, and we're going to go on to the, the next part there. How do we keep these commandments? Going back to our normal theme of the commandments are not only about not doing things, but they're also about actively doing things. So how do we keep these commandments? Letter A, by not 
plotting the tank, our name for, oh, it's supposed to be R. Um, never mind, I'm just dumb. Plotting to take or taking neighbor's stuff in a way that only appears blank or blank. It is. Proper or legal. Very good. Proper or legal. So what is the distinction being made here? That would be part, that would be the scheming part, yeah. But why is that being highlighted? Yeah, because it, it's not just a matter of, oh, well, it, it must be fine because I'm not doing anything unlawful, that you still have in your heart some intent to deprive something of, someone of something that God has given. Very good. So this is making a distinction that even if something is technically lawful or you're able to get away with it according to the laws, that doesn't make it not a violation of this command. Okay. Um, because there's all kinds of loopholes. Uh, and then uh, Micah 2 12, woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his, and his inheritance. So a form of this would be like, let's say you live in a community where you wield a lot of financial and social influence. You could set up the community environment in such a way where you would eventually force a particular person into having to sell their home. Maybe because you want the land on it because, I mean, we make movies about this stuff all the time, right? Whoa, I randomly found a oil vein in this person's backyard, but they don't know about it. So I want to make sure that they lose their house and then I get that property so I can make a ton of money from the oil vein, right? Like we make movies about stuff like that all the time. So that would be an example of what's being specifically highlighted here. All right, second one, plotting to lure or luring away our neighbors blank, blank, or employees. Spouse is one, friends. So <clears throat> plotting to lure or luring away our neighbors friends, spouse, or employees. We have the second Samuel reading there. So we want to read that for us. Oh, that one's not listed there. Okay, well, let's look that one up. Sorry, it's in there, but it's not spelled out. So 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 to 4 is what we're going to look at here. Go ahead and read, Russ. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, is this not not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him and lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So most people know that story. David and Bathsheba, right? He went out. David, the king of all Israel, went out to the balcony on his palace and saw a very attractive woman bathing on her rooftop. And he said, I want that. And he's the king. So he took that. And how did God feel about that? He was not happy. Right? Do you remember what happens because he did that? What? Yeah, the, the child that was born of their union died. And there's something else that happened. Well, yeah, but what is the, there's another aspect to the punishment from God for all that stuff that he did. Well, all kinds of things went wrong for him. Yeah. His, his relationship with all, with all his children. Yeah. His, uh, his son's uh, taking the kingship and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. He's, he basically had strife in his family as a result of this. That was part of God's punishment. And when I mean strife, I mean like one of his sons wanted to kill him and make him be the king himself. Right. Um, so not a great thing. Okay, so those are, and I wanted to highlight the luring or luring away, right? So the example of this would be like the neighbor's wife or 
one of their children or something like this, right? If you want to turn them against their, their, their father or their husband and entice them over to you. It can even become like people will rationalize and say, well, it was there. I mean, they, they agreed to it. They were part of the idea. But you know, if that was a manipulated effort on your part, right? And it's even if it wasn't a manipulated effort on your part, it's still a sin, right? Even if you didn't entice or lure away, right? So a good example of that is Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Did Joseph entice or lure Potiphar's wife into being attracted to him? No, but she was. And so she tried to have an affair with him when Potiphar was away. So even if Joseph hadn't led her on or enticed her, if he had gone through with that, would it still have been a sin? Not just of adultery, but of covenant. Yeah. Right? It's still taking something that doesn't belong to you. Um, okay. And we'll get to, it'll be more clear why that's still a problem in this next part. So, uh, and now it's not to, by not doing, but by doing, being blank for all that God has given you. Thankful. thankful, content. Being thankful for all that God has given you. We have the Hebrews 13 passage there. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Right? So being thankful for all that God has given you. And then this is the big one, Philippians 2, 4. Helping others to retain what God has given them and encouraging their blank and workers to remain faithful and blank. Close. First one is spouse. There's your spouse and workers to remain faithful and loyal. So let's look at that Potiphar's wife thing again. Because this is what Joseph actually does. What does he do in response to her enticing him to commit adultery against Potiphar? What does Joseph do? He flees. He flees. Right? Not only does he flee, but he says this is not good. And by doing that, He's encouraging her to not be disloyal to her husband, right? And so even if you're not manipulating the situation and enticing or luring, if that, that situation arises, by the ninth and tenth commandments, we're called to encourage them to remain faithful to the person that they've made their vows and promises to. Right? Or, you know, if you've had a contract when you work for somebody and somebody tries to, to uh, Maybe they're they're your employee, and there's another employee that or employer that tries to poach them from you in violation of their contract. That would be a violation of this commandment. Right? He should be encouraging that that worker to honor the agreement he made with his, with you. Right? Same same sort of thing. Right? And ultimately, the reason that we want to encourage those things is because we're recognizing who gave them to them in the first place. That there's a reason you're here and you're you're where you are, you're doing the things you're doing. Right. So this is why this is sort of our response to a lot of cultures. Um, temporary convenience reasoning in a lot of ways, right? Is like, well, I'm no longer feeling the fire, or um, our situation is no longer what it was before. It's we're, we're more tied up for cash or, or whatever it may be. And then we use those as reasons to violate agreements we've made or deny God's provision for ourselves or others or whatever it may be. And here the commandments are making clear that that's in violation of, of God's law. And ultimately, a lack of trust in his lordship, his sovereignty. Because okay. we talked about that a couple of times, and if you're breaking the ninth or tenth commandment, which commandment are you also breaking? By definition. First. The first. Right. Okay. How are we tempted to covet? So 
I think this is going to be the bulk of our discussion today. Because um, I've got, I've read a couple of books that I found very helpful, and I think very helpful for Christians at large, to understand the nature of how this plays out, especially in our current culture. Okay? So how are we tempted to covet? How do you foster desire? Not just covenant desire, but any desire. How do you foster desire? Advertisement on TV. Okay, great example. What do they do in an advertisement on TV? They make you believe you can't live without it. Okay. <laughs> they make you believe that you can't live without it. And how do they do that? What do they, what, what do they present to you? A great life. A great life, right? The book that I read calls it their picture of the good life, right? So in every advertisement you see, there's an assumption that your life is missing something. We're going to show you what that something is. And if you get it, we're going to show you a picture of what your life will be like if you do. Right? So they're crafting a desire within you by presenting you with a picture of the good life. Okay? Yeah, David. It's also subliminal. And that's sort of like Satan's way and how he attacks us. Yeah, it, it is very subliminal in a lot of ways. And if you ever read and get the opportunity to read about the sort of work that people do to craft these advertisements, it's pretty disturbing, to be totally honest with you. I mean, the, the amount of psychology and research that goes into those things. I read something about slot machines, which was just sort of horrifying. I mean, you have people that'll win like seventy or $80,000, and they'll just keep going and keep going until they have nothing, right? Because they've been sort of set up by the system where it, the goal isn't even winning the money anymore. It's, it's actually just the dopamine rush from playing the game. And they always make it like just close, but not quite, right? And it's the same with advertising, right? So they're giving you a picture of the good life. So the book that I read, it's uh, written by James K. Smith. It's called Desiring the Kingdom. It's a three-part series. Um, it's it's not for the light reader, so if you if you do want to read that, I can just talk to me and I can recommend it to you. Uh, but I'm going to kind of give you a synopsis of what he he claims. Uh, Pete, well, yeah, you bring up commercials and whatnot. Let's say it's a, a beer commercial for, for, for a hypothetical, and you see a guy, he's happy, he's got all these beautiful women around him, he's at the ball game, his ball team's winning, everything's going right, right? Yep. We have to be incredibly careful as Christians to put on that facade. Because there's a lot of Christians who let everyone know, hey, I'm happy, I'm smiling, everything's good with me. And inside, they're breaking. And we need to be very mindful to be able to trust other Christian brothers and sisters when we are breaking like that. Because not everything is humble glory all the time. And, and it's okay. Yeah, so Pete's comment is that uh, we have a tendency also to sort of present the good life in the same manner as advertisements do as Christians, which is, has its drawbacks, right? Um, there are certain things that can be guaranteed about Christianity and faith, right? So like the peace that we talked about today at church, that's a guarantee, right? And so I can say confidently that you have peace in Christ. Now, when I, I that's why I have to specify when I say that or when other Christians say that to you, they're not saying that you're not going to have troubles with your young children later today, or that you're not going to have stress at your job or all that other stuff, right? This is a, a deeper and abiding promise, right? Um, but it is important to be, like my generation, the millennials, I get a lot of flack, but I think one of the things that is an opportunity for the church is that we're obsessed with genuineness. Obsessed with genuineness. So if a millennial goes to something and they feel like they're being baited and switched or lied to in some manner, they're done. So if, if you're presenting church in a non-genuine way, it's off-putting even before they, they don't even really care what you're saying or talking about, right? And so it's important for us as Christians in order to foster the sort of environment you're talking about where people trust each other in a Christian context to be genuine about what is really real about the Christian life. And those pictures of the good life typically are very earthly focused. Right. And there really are no, I cannot guarantee that you're going to get a job where you make tons of money. And I can't guarantee that if you do that, you're going to be happy. I can't guarantee that 
the team you root for is going to win the Super Bowl or the World Series or whatever else. But none of those things are, are given in Scripture. I can't even guarantee that your life won't be free of real terrible tragedy and suffering in an earthly sense. And, but what I can guarantee is that the peace of the Lord that was given to you at the resurrection of Jesus means that your ultimate hope in the future is set and certain. And that you will live forever in heaven with him. Okay. Um, so it's important to make those distinctions. So back to this book. <clears throat> so the claim that he makes is ever since Aristotle, or not Aristotle, um, I'm mixing up my philosophers here. Uh, who's the Rene Descartes? Ever since Rene Descartes said, I think, therefore I am, the enlightenment occurs and everybody thinks that human beings are primarily rational creatures. Now he contends that that is not true. And one of the examples I like to give is how many of you know by show of hands that if you ate less pizza and popsicles and ice cream and went to the gym on a daily basis, you would be a healthier person? How many of you know that? <laughs> Okay, how many of you regularly live that out? Well, what, what's going on? I mean, aren't you rational people? You understand the rationality, so what's the deal, right? So his argument is that human beings are actually primarily desiring creatures. And what motivates us to action are desires, okay? And the reason that's important to distinction to make is it helps us view things that we think are sort of innocuous and non-dangerous aspects of human culture and understand what's really going on, okay? So if your child likes fashion, is that necessarily a problem? No. If your child feels like they're less than and their sense of self is tied to the sort of clothes they wear, is that a problem? Yes. Yes, what's happened? What's different between those two examples? Heart and mind. In what way? Well, they have to go look like everybody else. They gotta be somebody. They gotta look like everybody else. Gotta be somebody. What drives those thoughts? The insecurity. Um, yeah. they, they wish to be secure, so they made the clothes the item. Okay. Yeah. Right. So they wish to be secure. Right. Where do we as Christians find our security? Jesus. Christ. In Christ, right? And so our primary identity as a result of that is not man, woman, father, son, wife, daughter, etc. It's child of God. Okay. So even if I'm wearing ratty clothes and I can't have the newest game system or whatever, that's not an existential crisis for me because that's not related to my primary identity. But when it becomes related to your primary identity, what's happened is you are following a different picture of the good life. And that's a significant thing. Because if you're following a different picture of the good life, your understanding of what's missing in your life is often incorrect. And the solution to that missing piece is often incorrect. So in the case of the, the, the kid who's obsessed with clothes, they think that the missing thing in their life isn't sin, like it isn't freedom from sin. They think the missing thing in their life is they just don't have the right clothes. And on TV, they saw this happen. If I just had the right clothes, my life would be perfect. I'd be happy and hot, and all my friends would be happy and hot. Right? Because that's the picture they've been given. Right? And so that becomes their goal. That's the motivation for the way they behave and live. Is that antithetical to the picture of the good life presented in the scriptures? It is. Right? It's actually driving them to a different goal, which is serious business. And I think that's one of the reasons why in our culture, a lot of Christian families have just sort of woken up and found that their kids believe stuff that's radically different than they do, even though they've been talking about it. Because advertisers in our culture are so good at crafting a desiring narrative. And we're here a lot of times targeting the brain that we lose out because we're not crafting the desire of the good life in, in, in the Christian faith. And we have a great picture to cast, by the way, and one that people desperately need, right? So, um, so this is a, like, this desire orientation helps us see things. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take one of the examples and really go in depth on it here real quick, but Cooper has something. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can uh, describe how it works with our kids. So our kids are 10, seven and five, right? So they've been in cyber school all year, 
right? They're issued these iPads, which <laughs> become sort of the bane of our existence as parents. Well. <laughs> you know, I mean, necessary, of course, but, um, you know, we try to limit reason lim reasonable limits on their screen time, right? And now it's not so easy to enforce, you know? It's, uh, there's so many ways and they can get on their iPad and they can be, you know, logged into a school meeting and then they can open up YouTube in the background, right? And so it's hard to lock it down. But what, what is it that they're looking after? I mean, insecurity is one of them, but like for, for these kids, it's like, you know, just stuff that other people have. So the, the, the things they find on YouTube, despite how many times we try to like lock it down, et cetera, it's like, uh, okay, they'll watch like toy videos of like, unwrapping toys, you know, they'll watch stuff about, uh, there's like Mr. Beast, some guy who's, they're all impressed because he's driving Lamborghinis and stuff, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, it's all this, it's all this like bang, like you want this, it's video games. And so the kids, they, they're always talking about, oh man, we really want this like super ultimate this and that. And, you know, what about the Lamborghini? And so it's, it's very interesting, but it, it doesn't have to be from a traditional advertiser, right? It can just be like the product itself is YouTube and people make a living by, you know, enticing in there. And, you know, we all have it, right? I mean, if we think about the amount of time, I mean, I know personally, it's like, it's so easy to get sucked into, I wanna read about this this product, right? I wanna do research, I wanna find this thing, this thing. And it's like, before you know, you know it, all our time can go into what is the next thing? So, and even for kids, right? Kids are just, we, it's like living, I don't know what the, the verse is, but living by like what we see, right? Living by sight and just when, when our eyes see something, you know, it could be gratuitous, but whatever it is, you know, the, the neighbors have something, we just want it because somebody else has it, you know? My brother has something. Well, why, why don't I have it? Should I have that? You know, <laughs> we, we never want to be convinced. And, and, I, and I don't want you to hear what I'm saying is in that all of those things are bad. Like you, I don't want you to come away and be like, well, my kids are never watching YouTube again. Uh, I'm never going to let them have any photos on the internet, you know, all this other stuff. Like, I'm not, not saying that, but what I am saying is there's something going on underneath those behaviors that makes a significant difference as to the end result, right? So if your kid is participating in social media in a healthy way, that is fine and should be encouraged, right? If they're encouraging their friends, if they're using it as a means of, of staying connected, but when it starts to become something that they depend on and then it affects their sense of self, that's where you have to start paying attention, right? And it's the same with clothing. It's the same with sports. I mean, think about this. So I asked parents when I was a family minister to start reading the Bible with their kids before they can understand the English language, okay? And you start talking like that. And even among Christian circles, people are like, whoa, okay, whoa. <laughs> whoa, that's a little much, right? And they're telling me that while their kid's in a Steelers onesie. <laughs> okay? And then it's, it's, it's sort of an ironic, funny thing, but at the same time, it's quite serious. You've already started teaching them your values about your sports team, and you haven't about your God. That's a problem, right? And it's, it's not that you can't do that. Don't hear me saying, like, don't buy your kids your Steelers onesie. That's totally fine. But you're, you are teaching them about the priorities of your life and what their priorities about life should be and the order and manner and emphasis of which you place on all those things, right? So it's great. I'm a Cardinals fan. I grew up in St. Louis. Right. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but it was, it never became, even though my dad loves the Cardinals and he's a huge fan, it, it never became a huge obsession of my life, right? It's something I enjoyed, but it wasn't something I found worth. My, my feelings don't rise and fall with the season of the, the St. Louis Cardinals, right? And my hope is that you're still with the season of the Steelers. And, you know, like, it's okay to be upset when they lose and all that stuff, but you're not like selling your house and moving away in despair, <laughs> you know, those sorts of things. But the example that I like to highlight from this book, just because it really helped me think about some of these things in a more accurate context. So most people think it's only religious if it's explicitly or outwardly religious. And that's not the case, right? Religion as a human construction is more of a philosophy. So you can have something actually be a religion that appears totally secular. It may not say it has a God named such and such. 
that you have to make sacrifices to on this day and that day are facing this direction. But it is a religion in the devotion that it inspires and the end result of promises, right? So just think of any clothing advertisement you've ever seen. Abercrombie and Fitch, whatever. What they do is they give you a picture of how often, when's the last time you saw a fat person in a clothing commercial? Never. Never. Why not? Fat people wear clothes too, don't they? Right? Huh? It's not attractive. It's not attractive, right? We're crafting a desire here, folks. Right? So there's always like very attractive, very fit people wearing the clothes, even though the vast majority of people buying them are not looking like that. Because the presentation is, this is the thing you're missing. And if you get this, then this will be the result, right? And the, the, the place that he takes that example, which is really fascinating to me, is he says, think about it just in order to help you see that this has religious function, let's just rename the things that go on, okay? So is there an altar in a department store? The cash register, right? It's a table where the thing that's missing is being presented and being given, right? And it's being given at a price. Okay, so who is the presiding minister or the priest or the pastor? The clerk. the clerk, right? Because they're the gatekeeper for doling out this thing you're missing that's going to make your life better. And when you walk into right? the store, they always greet you and say, how may I help? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> they put a lot of effort and energy into making those sorts of environments welcoming and comforting. So that you can buy the product to be fully satisfied with your life and then end up looking hot and happy and have a bunch of friends who are hot and happy. Right? That's the way it goes. So, what I'm, I, once again, I'm not saying don't go to the store and buy stuff. Okay? <laughs> but take note, either in your own life or in the lives of your kids or your friends, when that takes on a religious significance for someone. Okay? And it's not going to outwardly look much different. That's the trick. Okay? That's why you have to be aware of that stuff. So I found that example super helpful because just the idea of envisioning the cash register as an altar helps me realize the potential that that has for our own sinful flesh or the devil to use it as a means of getting us away from Jesus. And it happens slowly over time, right? Before I know it, I've placed all my hope in the way I look and the clothes that I wear. It's not like it happened all at once and I made a conscious decision to do it. Right? And so that's why, in a lot of ways, as a family pastor, I viewed my job as a pastor of making parents aware of those things and giving them the resources and equipping them to be able to deal with and notice them when they happen. Because they are going to happen. Right? Uh, Pete. Well, I think it also comes down to knowing what the words mean. When you do something religiously, you have made it your religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and so that, that distinction becomes extremely helpful because... <laughs> What, like a lot of the things that people end up turning towards if they reject tradi a traditional form of religion, they think is just like life in this world. But philosophically, it functions exactly the same, right? So whether you're Democrat or Republican, if you think the government is going to solve all your problems, that's your religion. Because you're placing your ultimate security in the workings of the government, right? And it doesn't even matter which direction those workings go. It's just that that's, that's, that's what you think is going to solve the thing that's missing from your life. Right? Yeah, run. <clears throat> Getting back to the kids wearing these shirts and shirts. Sure. <laughs> Their parents are the worst people ever when you see them. <laughs> you go anywhere and you see all the parents have all this stuff on. The kids have all this stuff on. So the kids don't, they think that's a, that's the right thing to do. Yeah, because the parents are idiots with all this. I'm sure. Brian was, Brian was graciously pointing out that this isn't all entirely the children's fault. Um, and that, that their parents are passing this on to them, which is actually an important point, right? One of the one of the things that I like I like to say when it comes to like Christian families, and particularly the parents, is you will pass on your values. Period. You will. But most of the time, I would say, unless you're being intentional, the values you're passing on are not the ones you think you are, okay? 
And so the point that Ron's making is that moms and dads of these children who are obsessed with clothes are themselves obsessed with clothes. Their kids are just inheriting the values that their parents have passed them, right? And they're usually not great. And just because a value system didn't work out for you as an adult does not mean that you're not going to pass to your kids. It happens all the time. Right? That's why you, you'll see some people that are really religiously following some sort of cause, and they're the most miserable people you've ever met. Like they're they're just wired to view their life through misery. Right? Um, and so I wanted to bring that out about desire, particularly because in Lutheran circles, what is our primary target when we're thinking about the formation of young people in the faith, or even adults, really, new people in the faith? Well, we want to bring them to Christ, but what means, we're talking about the means by which we do that. What do we focus on? Education. Okay. And what is the focus of our education? Are we targeting desires or are we targeting the mind? We're targeting the mind, right? Now, not that that's not important, it is. Okay. But we've excluded desire from our mode of operation. And there's no reason not to. There's so many desirous things in the Christian faith and the image of the good life portrayed, right? Imagine, sort of like the cash register, that all you've ever known your entire life, in order to get the thing that's going to make you happy, you have to pay a price. And someone comes along and says, actually, I follow that God for a while myself. Let me tell you about somebody who gives you the ultimate thing that fills that missing thing. And, he's and it's free. Price. And he paid the price for you. It's free. Amen. There's got to be a catch. No, there's not. Just faith in him. There's a gift of the Holy Spirit that comes through hearing the very word that I'm speaking to you now. Right? Like people want that. They may not know specifically that it's Jesus that they need or want, but that is what they're looking for. I mean, why do you think people fly around all over the country to express outrage over? moral causes when they claim there is no moral thing anymore. Why do you think that people fly around to hear leaders speak when they're offering them only temporary reprieve? Because nobody has to convince other people that something's wrong in our world. Everybody sort of intrinsically understands that. So all the motivations and machinations of their life is an attempt to fill that void and figure out what the heck's going on so that we can get past that. Right? Some people think we can do it in this life. By crafting the perfect government. Some people think that we can do that in this life by getting the perfect job and having enough money to where I finally feel secure. Right? Whereas we think that it's all about Jesus and what he's done for us, which is very free because it's free and it's complete. It's not about some temporary reprieve, but an eternal reprieve from the thing that's missing. Uh, you may have heard the expression that some people will say that you're trying to fill a God-sized hole with the wrong sort of thing. Only one thing fits there. Right? And that's sort of what we're talking about here. Right? And my point is that that's often talking about desire. So how, maybe there's somebody in here who wasn't a Christian their whole life. Maybe they became a Christian as an adult. Or maybe you know somebody who's become a Christian as an adult. It's rare. It does happen. But more often than not, the thing that convinces them of Christianity is not a rational argument. Right? When it's a gift of faith and brought through a desire given to them from the word of God. So that's why I love our liturgy, for example, because it's literally the words of God from scripture. Right? We're using the language of the scriptures to craft this desire, this picture of the good life. And the picture of a good life for the Christian is, are you going to experience some suffering in this life? Yeah. Or you may lose somebody you love. You may get a debilitating disease. But guess what? The big ultimate yawning abyss of the purpose of your life and what's going to happen when you die, all those things are answered. And the answers, by the way, are great. You're going to live forever. Your sins are forgiven. And not by anything you do, but what he does. Right? And so you start crafting this desire, this picture that accomplishes and fills that void. Right? And that's what we're called to do, right? That's what we're setting up to, to bring to people. So 
I just want you to bring that up so you start thinking about things like going to sports games and going to the store and those things, which understood in their proper context are harmless and often good. Okay. But the devil gets in there, our own simple flesh gets in there, and then they become anything but harmless. And it's important to recognize the difference. And that's all related to desire. Any questions about that? So in summation at that point, go root for the Steelers, the Pirates, the Cardinals, whatever. But don't place any sort of hope in them. Seriously. Even if they're the best team ever, they win year after year after year. Who cares? When we all die, they die too. They don't come with us. Jesus does. Okay. okay. Um, let's open up our Bibles to Psalm 107. Uh, here, maybe it's in, in here. Let's see. Uh, Russ, can you look up Psalm 107? Uh, Mark, can you look up Colossians 3, 5? And Jim, can you look up Psalm 37, verse 4? You got it, Russ? Yep. Go ahead. And when they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress, he led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul, he fills with good things. All right, so is all desire sinful? No. no. Right? In fact, God desires you, so I sent Jesus, and he wants to provide, and his provision is to fulfill many of the desires he created within you, right? Which is what Psalm 107 is talking about there. Very good. Okay, uh, Colossians 3 5, Mark. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Thank you, right? Put to death those things in you, is what it says, right? These earthly desires, right? Uh, Psalm 37, verse 4. Find your delight in the Lord, who will give you your heart's desire. Mm -hmm. Find your delight in the Lord who will give you your heart's desire. So one of the things that we operate on is that as people corrupted and infected with original sin, does that affect our heart's desires? It most certainly does. So do we know what's best for our heart's desires? No, right? Something that may be like the deepest desire of my heart could be totally wrong. So when I pray for that and God says no, then my trust in him is that he knows better than I what the desire of my heart ought to be. Because there's a deeper satisfaction that I need that I may be even not aware of that he's going to provide and what he brings. Okay. Any questions about commandments 9 and 10, coveting, desire, all that? Yeah, Mark. Boy, 10 minutes. Um, so it looks like you'll Commandment 9 is kind of the hard goods, and Commandment 10 is sort of the soft goods. Is there a covetousness of relationships? And do you think that that fits into this same category? So the question was, is there a covetous, covetousness of relationships? Yeah. Um, I would say that that would fall under 10. So 10 is not just like the coveting of, because often actually, if you covet your neighbor's wife, you're not really coming to her like you want her as your wife. You're coveting the, the things that she would bring you, right? Or the relationship that would be there. So maybe you live alone and you you just talk to your neighbor's wife over the fence a couple of times. And she's really nice and she's very attractive and you covet the fact that you don't have a relationship. Like that. I think that's built into that, that, that desire. Good question. Okay. And, and that also, I guess, touches on to the, like, relationships can become idolatrous, right? Where you're thinking that, oh, well, my life isn't complete until I find that perfect woman or perfect man, right? And scripturally speaking, that's not really the case. Like, because some people have been given the gift of celibacy, and they're not too married, like Paul, right? So would you say Paul's life was incomplete in Christ because he didn't have a wife? No, right? Some of the most 
dangerous situations I was ever put in were having relationships with people that I coveted their lifestyle and how they were, yeah. who, who they were, and try to be like them. Right. Yeah. So um, the coveting of someone's lifestyle or the way that they carry themselves and wanting to wanting to have that yourself. Uh, yeah, that's all all part of that because that again goes back to the lack of trust in God's provision for the way you are in your life, right? Or it even in extreme cases can result in the rejection of yourself, which is against God as well because He made you who you are um, specifically, right? And uh, that's a good thing. Any other questions? All right. So now we're gonna do a little summary here. We're not going to go through all of these things. I just wanted to have them here on the handout for you so you can read them uh, at your leisure. But we're going to go through a few of them. So this is sort of the summary of our Ten Commandments section. So the Ten Commandments are what? They are a set of laws, right? And laws have conditions, right? Laws say, if this is done, then this will happen. If this is not done, then this will happen, right? Um, and so the law is judgy, just by its nature, right? That's what it does, right? It's the standard by which judges, judging occurs. So there can be some misunderstandings that result from the law. And so these, I just listed two of the main ones. The law drives us away from our sin to Christ Jesus alone. If we are led to either of the following false conclusions, we have not properly understood the law. So number one, Despair and frustration, which says it's not possible for me to be Christian, right? As soon as I read that, I thought of Ron's question about lusting. It's like, I just can't, like, it's in that, like, it's, I can't, you know, what, like, how do I, it seems impossible, right? And if he remains there, then he's misunderstood the law. Because the law's function in defeating ourself, our self-reliance, I should say, is to point us to Christ, right? It's not to get us to just despair, it's, but it is to get us to despair of our own self-actualization, our self-ability, right? And to turn and rely on the thing that actually does save. Okay? And number two, security in one's own accomplishments. So the famous group in the scriptures that this would fall to are the Pharisees, right? That, well, we keep all the laws, but this guy doesn't. Right? Look at your disciples. They're eating. They're eating these these this wheat kernels when they're not supposed to. Well, on the Sabbath day, blah blah blah. blah right. So, security in one's own one's own accomplishments is a misunderstanding of the law because it assumes that we're actually able to keep it. And part of Jesus' teaching when he came to the Pharisees is it's not just the outward appearance of things that God is concerned with, but the heart. And when we start getting into the heart stuff. You're done. Right? So Jesus is actually probably, we don't usually think of him this way, but he's the harshest law preacher in all of history. He was. He's the one that told you. Do you think that you're not killing anybody when you just don't go out and stab them with a knife? Truly, I say to you, if you have hate in your heart for them, you're guilty of breaking this commandment. Oof, that'll blow your hair back. Right? Well, I thought I was keeping that law, but I broke it seven times this week. <laughs> yeah. the last 10 minutes yeah. right and let it be there the law leads to the gospel so the law leads us to the realization that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you god in thought word and deed so we're sound familiar right and because of that we justly deserve not only your present punishment but also your eternal punishment right it's the gospel of jesus christ alone that shows us that we have a gracious God who forgives all of our sins for Jesus' sake. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. And there's a hymn there that has some lyrics that, that speak to that truth. So, in summation of our section on the law, let's go over one last time. What are the three uses of the law? Mirror, curb, and guide. What does the mirror do? Shows, shows, us our shows us our sin. What does the curb do? It keeps us from the consequences. It keeps us what? It 
it, it puts up a hindrance for us to do those things. Puts up a hindrance, and the hindrance is motivated by consequence. Okay. And what is the guy? Shows us which way to go, right? So the law is no longer something I'm following just because if I get caught breaking it, I'm in big trouble. It's I think I've been convinced or it's been revealed to me that this is the right way to live. Okay. Is that so, recognized by all denominations? Um, I don't think it's necessarily recognized by all denominations um, because most denominations have slightly different understandings of original sin. Okay. And original sin is pretty integral into understanding our, our relationship with the law, right? So that we don't have any sort of synergistic approach. So I would say if you have a synergistic approach, you're probably not doing this in exactly the same way. Um, yeah. I was just going to say too, like when you look at any one of these commandments, they're actually keeping us from harm. Yes. You know, yeah. Because when you think of some of them and the consequences are just can be just devastating um, to us. Right, very good. Yeah. Other people around us as well. So the point Sandy's making is that when you look at the commandments, they're they're actually there to like help us from doing things that would harm us. And Paul gets at that, right? He he asks, like, is the law of God bad? He says, by no means. Just because it makes me feel bad when I read it doesn't mean it is bad. It means I am bad, right? And that's what that mirror function is, right? So like you shall not commit adultery. Oh, you're ruining all my fun, God. Right? That's not what it's there for. It's there because if you do that, God knows because he made you that it ultimately causes you a serious amount of harm. And not just you, but children and all your other relationships. And he wants to spare you from that. Right? Now, sometimes in our own ignorance, we don't necessarily see that, which is why the faith and the trust component is important. And even if I don't feel like I understand what God is doing, I'm still going to trust him in this situation because he is who he is. Very good. I think she, she said a mouthful, and there's a lot of people who think, oh, the Old Testament God is the God of wrath, and the New Testament God is the God of love. It's the same God. God has always loved, and he gave the law out of love. So Pete's making a comment about the the really sort of naive soft soap statement that people make sometimes about like, well, God is love, so this stuff can't be real. Um, the problem is, and this is where the understanding of original sin is super important, is like you can find the worst tragedies in the Old Testament, and some of them that we would say seem like tragedies but are commanded by God to be done, like when Joshua goes into the the, the, uh, the Canaan Canaanite territory, he's commanded by God. Kill every man, woman, and child. And we're like, oh, that's horrible. That's just terrible. Well, it's only terrible if anyone is worthy of being alive in the first place. And by understanding original sin, nobody's really worthy of being alive in the first place. The only reason we're still alive, even though we screwed up God's creation, is at his mercy. So I had a teacher at the seminary who really drove that home in the book of Job. Because a lot of times people think the book of Job is about like dealing with suffering. It's really not about that. It's dealing with the reality that God is God and you are not God. And that means that you are totally at his mercy. Period. That means he can do whatever he wants to you. Period. The great joy of the gospel is he's informed us what he has chosen to do. Despite the fact that we've royally screwed up his creation and turned our backs on him, right? Um, and so if you don't have that understanding of original sin, it makes complete sense to me why somebody would read the scriptures and, and think that about the Old Testament stuff. Because it's hard to, to reconcile loving God if he's doing that to people who are like sort of good. Because I really struggle with that as a teenager. People say, like, why bad things happen to good people? And Luther's response to that question was, where, where's a good person? Have you met one? I haven't. Right. We so and we can get into the details of some of that a little bit later, but but that's essentially the, the way we approach them. Okay. We actually we actually did it. Hooray. <laughs> um let's close with a word of prayer. And then next week we're going to be starting on the creeds. So we're going to be starting on the first, second, and third article of the creed. Um, people had a lot of good initial questions about things like what happens 
after we die and the judgment of Jesus when he comes back and all that stuff. So we'll be covering those in the course of the creed part of the class. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your provision in our lives. Help us to understand that it's probably far greater than we realize. May that grant us humility and thankfulness for all that you've given us. And regardless of what we're blessed with in this earthly life, we have a treasure worth more than any in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And help us place our hope, our contentment, and our joy in that treasure alone. So we can face the things that the sinful world offers with the sense of grace and humility and peace that is one in the reality of our resurrected Jesus. All these things we ask in his name. Amen. Have a good week, guys.